as of recently, there seems to be a lot of historical figures that have been discovered to be gay. Alexander the Great was apparently gay. I mean, that's how he was portrayed in the Netflix adaptation. There are also claims that William Shakespeare and Abraham Lincoln were also gay. There may be some truth to these claims, but most of these gay revisionist historians aren't all that excited to try and claim this one guy. You know who I'm talking about. It, it's in the title. Adolf Hitler. Can't say I blame them. No one wants to have their movement associated with Hitler, but the evidence for Hitler's homosexuality is quite oppressing, even if most mainstream sources say it's just a rumor. Mostly because there isn't any 100% concrete evidence. But there is more evidence of his homosexuality than there is of most other historical figures who were supposedly gay. This may sound like a crazy claim. You might be saying, but, 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 homophobia was an explicit policy of the Third Reich. What, was Hitler a hypocrite or something? Someone as noble as Hitler could never be a two-faced liar. But over the course of this series, you will find out how his probable homosexuality influenced his homophobic policies. Also, disclaimer, I'm not just going to talk about Hitler's homosexuality. In later parts, I'm also going to be talking about the influence of other gay leaders within the Third Reich's leadership as well. Some may construed that I'm saying modern gay rights movements like the LGBT are connected with Hitler's Germany, which is ridiculous. The way gay men in the movement viewed it was very much different from the modern view. Hitler was a vegetarian, but that doesn't have anything to do whether it's a good or bad movement. The same is true of homosexuality. But the role homosexuality played in the National Socialist movement can't be denied, especially in its early days. Okay, one more disclaimer, I'm going to use the term National Socialist more than Nazi, because, you know, YouTube doesn't like that word. So don't get confused when I use that term. They pretty much mean the same thing. Most Hitler books usually focus on his politics or historical influence. His life before politics is often seen as a minor detail compared to the time he was in power. And what he did in private is more seen as a fun fact, like Hitler loving movies and cars. But it's not uncommon for people to say Hitler had no personality and was purely a political being. One of the most respected Hitler historians, Ian Kershaw, said, Outside politics, Hitler's life was largely a void, and states that anyone trying to document Hitler is to focus not upon the personality of Hitler, but upon the character of his power. Aside from this being a subjective statement, as brilliant as Kershaw was, he didn't write a Hitler biography. He wrote more about the socio-historical significance of Hitler, and his biography didn't divulge anything new about Hitler as a person. Kershaw failed to blend Hitler's private and public worlds together. Having the charisma to get a country to elect him as dictator is not befitting of someone who had no personality. Ever since Kershaw's biography was published in 1998, it is regarded as the end-all be-all of Hitler books. When you look up best Hitler biography, this is literally the first one to come up. And with this, Hitler is now viewed as the weird paradox of a man with the charisma of an unperson without an inner core. I mean, it's a great book. It's just not really a Hitler biography. It's definitely easier to view Hitler as a purely political being because his politics are the easiest to see because of the horrors they caused. But his personal life, the 30 years of existence he had before he became a politician may shed some light on who he really was. What was his environment, his behavior, his emotional life, and how he tried to find what everyone wants, happiness. For Hitler, very little of that came from relations with women or family. So what gave his life meaning before he got into politics? In an attempt to find this out, I'll be required to humanize him. Some people may mistake this as an apologetic work, but Hitler was a human and had human problems and desires. But this is by no means trying to say that Hitler was misunderstood or that he wasn't at fault for his crimes. Hitler is one of the de facto meanie heads of history, and I am by no means trying to defend him. Oh, and for my sources, I'll put a lot of them on screen, but if you want to do a more thorough fact check, consult the book The Hidden Hitler by Lothar Macthane, which is where I got most of the information for this video. If you really want to, you can have the fun job of fact checking his like 100 pages of citations. Although I believe the first piece of evidence I'm presenting is on the weaker side, I want to start in chronological order. 
but regardless, it's still very revealing, especially when taken in context of information in later parts of the video. What we know about Hitler's early life is fuzzy. We do know he wanted to be an artist, but he failed in that endeavor, and seemed to wander aimlessly until he became a politician years later. But there's a bit more to his early life than that. Hitler was born on April 20th, 1889, and in 1903, Hitler's widowed mom moved to a new town with her sister and her children. Hitler attended a junior high school and had poor grades. He dropped out of school and returned to live with his family, but soon after his return home, his mom died. He then met an apprentice decorator named August Kubizek, whom we got some very interesting insights about Hitler from. The information comes from his book, The Young Hitler I Knew. The intimacy they had was far from typical. The way Kubizek writes about the relationship made them sound more like lovers than mere close friends. Both were infatuated with theater and opera, and would take long walks together in charming rural towns. Hitler was the more egocentric personality who always had grand visions, and Kubizek was content with the role of patient listener. Kubizek said he was intelligent and imaginative, but also erratic and impulsive. In the book, Kubizek always compared himself as his intellectual inferior. Many people look back and say this relationship was one-sided, and that he was just a receptacle for Hitler's flow of words. But the relationship seemed mutually reciprocal. They both very much saw each other's company. Kubizek speaks of true affection, mutual understanding, and great empathy. He said, My friendship with Adolf Hitler bore from the outset the stamp of the unusual. Even though he always stuck to his own point of view, Kubizek said Hitler could also be so considerate that sometimes he made me feel quite ashamed. Kubizek described their closeness as, by God, nobody on earth, not even my mother who loved me so much and knew me so well, was as capable of bringing my secret aspirations into the open and making them come true as my friend. Hitler was seething with jealousy when Kubizek interacted with others. Hitler told Kubizek, I can't bear it that you should mix with other young people and talk to them. This was an exclusive relationship. He would never have tolerated my having any interest in other people. As always, our friendship had to be utterly exclusive of all other interests. To me, that sounds more like a love affair than a friendship. Friendships aren't mutually exclusive. Even the best of friends usually have other people to hang out with. A romantic relationship is a purely exclusive one. When they lived in Linz, they used to buy lottery tickets in hopes of winning it big so they could be a pair of affluent artists living in the Austrian capital. They dreamed of buying a house together, and Hitler already had a decor picked out for it. An idea that particularly delighted Kubizek is when Hitler suggested that they dress the same so people would think they were brothers. Outwardly, they wanted to appear as a couple. They would go on long excursions to streams and go swimming, and on their longer hikes they would stay the night together, which they did often. And one of their goals was a long trip to Bayreuth, and Bayreuth was a known spot for homosexuals since it had a booming gay subculture. They were both huge fans of Richard Wagner's music, and it played an important role in their relationship, but it was well known at the time Wagner's music had a cult-like following among homosexuals. I mean, lots of straight people liked him too, don't get me wrong, but people at the time realized, for whatever reason, gay men were especially attracted to his music. Hitler found other people repulsive, but Hitler took Kubizek's hand many times and is described in great detail. In their happy reunion at Vienna's Westbahnhof in 1908, Kubizek describes in an earlier version of his memoirs, my friend, who was already awaiting me on the platform, greeted me in joyful excitement with a kiss and took me straight to his lodgings, where I myself was to spend the first night. I think this story best summarizes their relationship. Kubizek and Hitler were roaming through the mountains, when suddenly a violent rainstorm showed up. They got soaked, but they found an old barn to take refuge in. Kubizek was worried because Hitler was really vulnerable to illness, so he made him get naked and forced him to lay in some linen sheets he found in the barn. He wrapped him up tightly and put another layer on him. Kubizek then wrung out his clothes and hung them up and then wrapped himself in one of the sheets. He eventually added some hay on both their bales to make sure they didn't get cold. But he added some hay on both their bales to make sure they didn't get cold. They heard a dog barking in the distance, so he knew other people were around in the worst case scenario. But Hitler didn't care. 
he only liked Kubizek, since other people were repulsive to him. When Hitler awoke, he stood in the doorway, still naked, and threw the linen over his shoulder like a toga. I think Kubizek and Hitler had a relationship that goes beyond a platonic friendship. Their tender concern for each other's welfare, physical proximity, erotic attraction, and the desire for secluded togetherness. Kubizek, whether consciously or unconsciously, told the story of a romantic love affair. We don't know how far they went in their relationship. Kubizek published this in the 50s, so he couldn't just come out as gay without ruining his reputation. He had a wife and kids at this point. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but did Kubizek mention any relationships with women? Nope, nothing physical. Hitler supposedly liked this girl named Stephanie, but when it didn't work out, Kubizek said after the experience with Stephanie, he was now a woman hater. But there's doubt to whether she was real. Kubizek probably wanted to make Hitler seem capable of loving a woman, to make Hitler look better. He was loyal to the end. Even after all of Hitler's crimes were exposed, he still defended him. He talks about their supposed romance in great detail, but its arbitrary long-windedness makes it seem fake. Supposedly, she was everything to Hitler. He described her as the only person in God's earth extraneous to abominable humanity, a creature who, transfigured by radiant love, had imparted meaning and content to his tormented existence, sense, and purpose. This seems like a projection Kubizek uses to relativize him and Hitler's relationship. And to top off why Stephanie was probably fake, Hitler made no attempt to be with his beloved, which seems out of character. Hitler liked very few things, and the few things he did like, he pursued voraciously. Kubizek also mentions that women were very attracted to Hitler, but Hitler intentionally avoided women. My friend lived in self-imposed asceticism regarding girls and women. One day when Kubizek was showing a pretty girl his music, Adolf came into the room and said nothing, but hardly had the girl go outside than he went for me wildly. Kubizek said, I had a job to convince him that the girl was not suffering from the pangs of love, but from examination pains. The result was a detailed speech about the senselessness of women studying. It would make sense that Hitler, being the pompous misogynistic artist type that he was, if he saw art and scientific skill as the most attractive traits in people, and him thinking all women as incapable of art or science, he wouldn't be attracted to any of them. Kubizek and Hitler spent only four months together in Vienna before going their own ways. According to Kubizek, it was because he did his military service after spending the summer in Linz with his parents and did not return to Vienna until 1908. By then, Hitler disappeared without a trace. But Kubizek was not old enough yet and would have done his military service in 1909, not 1908. And it's weird that after the August of 1908, they didn't contact each other again until 1933, 25 years later. Why would such close friends go so long without contacting each other? Why the secrecy? Who knows? But at the end of their time together, their relationship steadily deteriorated. Kubizek felt like an improper interloper since Hitler got really into politics, and Kubizek didn't really care about politics. Also, Hitler started roaming the city by himself and would be gone for days at a time, which started to put a strain on their relationship. In September of 1909, after leaving his apartment, Hitler disappeared for five months. We're not sure where he was or what he did, but it's commonly suggested that he was homeless. But after five months off the radar, he turned up on the hostel on Melda Monstros. It was no secret during the early 1900s that municipal hostels for homeless men were hubs of homosexual activity. Some occupants participated in it because of their lack of contact with women, some did it because they liked it, and some did it for financial reasons. Hitler spent three years in this environment. The hostel on Mel de Monstras was a somewhat luxurious lodging that was exclusively for men. About 70% of its occupants were under 35, and it had a low turnover rate. Reinhold Hainisch met Hitler here, and we got some good info from him. But who was this Hainisch guy? 
He was 25 when he first came to the hostel in 1909 and said he worked as a manservant in Berlin before he got there, whatever that means. And he went to prison for theft at one point. We don't know how much time he spent at Mel de Monstras, but we do know that he got to know Hitler during the winter of 1909 to 1910. He was probably there longer, but he checked in under fake names a lot, but not always. So we do know where he was at a few points, but we do know for sure that him and Hitler were close during the early 1910s. Okay, flash forward 20 years to the 30s, and Hainish tried to make money off his former friendship with Hitler and it didn't work very well. He was arrested twice for trying to forge fake Hitler paintings, but he did have some real ones. But after the arrest, Hitler instructed someone to confiscate everything. Hainish was later in more serious trouble for collaborating with people critical of Hitler, such as Konrad Haydn, when he was on trial. In 1936, he was arrested again, allegedly because of more fake Hitler works. But most likely, the arrest took place because of the two manuscripts he had that no longer exist that detailed the time he spent with Hitler. A few weeks after his arrest, at age 33, he supposedly died of a heart attack in jail. Hainish had been dead for two years when American publisher The New Republic magazine published I Was Hitler's Buddy. No one knows how the manuscript got to America, or what the original publication was based on, but it's about Hainish telling us how he got to know Hitler at the hostel for the homeless. Hainish said that Hitler was anything but a loner. He said he made friends with ease and had a big social group. He also talks about Hitler being completely broke, and how they did various odd jobs to make ends meet. They also founded their own firm, in which they supposedly sold Hitler paintings together. He also talks about Hitler's personal philosophy, political role models, and his view towards women. He notes how eccentric but unreliable Hitler was, but he still considered him a good friend. So far, the evidence does not point to Hitler being a big old gay boy yet, but we'll get there. Hainish was already at home in this very gay environment, and I'm sure his questionable past job as a manservant helped with this. Hainish said they were close friends and knew everything about each other, and this was confirmed by a fellow member of the hostel named Karl Liedenroth, who worked with Hainish during the early 30s. Liedenroth said they were on very close terms. So Hainish must have been pretty upset when a guy named Joseph Newman replaced him as Hitler's picture selling partner. Newman was 31 years old in 1910. He was an unmarried laborer and a secondhand dealer. He was registered at the Mel de Monstras from January to July of 1910. Hainish said that Newman was a businessman by profession and didn't shrink away from any work and was also described as a real friend of Hitler. One time in June, they checked out of the hostel for nearly a week. This was the only record of Hitler leaving the hostel, and he left with only 20 crowns in his pocket, which, which was very little money. We are told they went sightseeing in Vienna and spent most of the time at the museum, but th that's unlikely. Really, spending a week at a museum seems scarcely credible. According to sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, someone who personally studied this stuff at the time, overnight hostels were hotbeds of male prostitution. Many people who stayed at the Mel de Monstras were in desperate need of money, including Hitler. In the spring of 1911, Hitler supposedly made money from selling postcards and other artworks, but this is doubtful. Based on Kubizek and Hainish's statements, it seems unlikely that Hitler was capable of such concentrated and focused work. And even if he was that dedicated, making decent money as an artist in this environment was next to impossible. But according to many of his contemporaries, like Karl Honisch, a fellow member of the hostel, Hitler seemed better off financially than most other hostel members. He went from broke to comfortable in about a year. So where did the money come from? Prostitution. Hitler likely whored himself out for money. We don't know this for sure, but rumors of Hitler's past from credible people make it seem much more plausible. According to Ernst Hafstangl, one of Hitler's closest friends told the Secret Service in 1942 that the hostel Hitler stayed at was well known to be a place where elderly men went in search of young men for homosexual pleasures. It is probable that these types of old ruse and young gigolos became familiar to the young Adolf at this time. 
And another suspicious instance is when the Austrian Chancellor, Engelbert Dolfus, had given some incriminating material relating to Hitler's time in Vienna. It is reported that he brought this file to his friend and ally Benito Mussolini in 1934. Dolfus was assassinated a month after giving Mussolini the report. After the assassination, the Italian state press said that the National Socialist leaders were murderers and homosexuals. Hitler's time at the hostel was almost over. He soon met Rudolf Hostler, a man who was regarded as the black sheep of his family and was kicked out to the streets when he was 18. We don't know where they met, but we do know that Hostler joined Hitler at the Melden Monstras in February of 1913. They both bonded over their love of opera, specifically Wagner, and like Kubizek, took the role of the contented listener in the relationship. Hostler was eventually convinced by Hitler that they should move to Munich and share a room together. A lot of the information we have about Hostler comes from his daughter, Marianne Koppler. She was actually directly asked by historian Bridget Hamann if her dad and Hitler had a homosexual relationship. Koppler said he made no allusions to anything more than a friendly relationship, but she also said she knows on the other hand that he would never have told her such a thing. So the question if they were a couple at one point remains unanswered, but it's hard to miss the parallels this relationship has with August Kubizek. They both had middle lower class backgrounds, they both had jointly fused plans for the future, their fresh start in another city, and Hostler having a similar personality to Kubizek. Hostler's malleable character gave Hitler another chance to try what had failed with Kubizek. Hence, Hitler, age 24, moved with 19-year-old Hostler to Munich. But why did they move to Munich instead of another place? Why not go back to Vienna or some other city? A contemporary viewer of Munich at the time wrote that it was a regular El Dorado for homosexuals. They settled in the Schwabing district. Schwabing at the time was considered a place that had a mass settlement of oddballs. Everyone of every type lived here. Painters, sculptors, models, philosophers, revolutionaries, sexual moralists, musicians, craftswomen, religious people, industrious people, and lazy people. It was a place that had less enforcement of any kind of social standard, and therefore was more accepting of just about everything, including homosexuality. So it's not hard to see why a place like this would attract Hitler. But the problem he always had popped up again. He failed to make it as an artist. Although his landlady, Anna Pop, said Hitler worked sun up to sun down selling his art to pay the bills, that's highly unlikely. Artists in the area, much more skilled than Hitler, said it to be impossible to make it financially there. And plus, Anna Pop was probably being told what to say in the interview. Plus, Hitler wasn't the type to work sun up to sun down on anything. So it's surprising he was able to come up with an annual income of 1,200 Reichsmarks when he was competing against thousands of other painters. We have testimony of Hitler struggling to sell his art at a beer garden. A man named Dr. Schirmer saw Hitler, who he described as a very shabby looking man, going from table to table trying to make a sale. It must have been around 10 o'clock at night when I noticed him again and saw that he still hadn't sold his picture. When he passed near me soon afterward, I asked him, being touched by his predicament from a purely human standpoint, whether he would be willing to sell the picture. They agreed to a price, although Dr. Shermer didn't have enough money on him to pay it in full, and Hitler agreed to call him the next morning. They talked again, and Hitler offered to paint him more pictures. The doctor stated that although my own financial situation wasn't easy at the time, he agreed, and Hitler delivered all the promised works within a week. Shermer again sensed that he was having a hard time of it, but he was also too proud to accept charity. On the other hand, he seemed to have realized that I wasn't a wealthy man, and I think that was why he never called again. Hitler yet again was having financial problems and struggling to sell his art, but he was eventually able to earn 1,200 Reichsmarks a year. Could Hitler have been prostituting himself here too? We'll probably never know. Hitler always wanted to be a part of the affluent bohemian lifestyle and tried to become acquainted with those higher up in the circle. And for the most part, he failed in this endeavor. He did have good relations with a man named Dr. Schnell. We're not sure of the extent of this relationship, but they were very close. He bought some of Hitler's art, purchased opera tickets for him, 
and invited him to his house many times. But there's an even more suspicious figure, a semi-high up figure in the bohemian circle, the mythologist named Alfred Scholler. He was called an erotic advocate of the swastika and had no qualms practicing homosexuality. It's reported while seeking gay contacts in Schwabing to have come across a young man named Adolf. Among other things, Alfred Schuller had an anti-Semitic esoteric worldview and proclaimed the advent of a new era in a racial dystopia. Hitler sought him out and was no doubt influenced by this guy, since he did, on several occasions, look for ideological enlightenment from him in Vienna. So, it's possible that the gay contact he was looking for was Adolf Hitler, since he for sure knew him. After nine months of living with Hitler, Hostler decided to move out because Hitler was quick to anger, held grudges, and was a know-it-all yapper. This failed relationship and the outbreak of World War I changed Hitler's priorities from becoming an affluent bohemian to becoming a soldier. Hans Mend was a soldier who served with Hitler in the war, and unlike Kubizek and most others that hint at Hitler's homosexuality, he was not afraid to be blunt. Most people who knew about Hitler's gayness were gay themselves, and since it was still very much stigmatized at the time, it would have hurt their reputations just as much as Hitler's. Hans Mend is one of the only witnesses who is explicit about Hitler's private life. In September of 1948, a German diplomat named Werner Otto von Hentig received a letter from London, which contained a Hitler document, and we didn't know the content of this letter until four decades later. What was inside? It was the Mend Protocol. The Mend Protocol played an important role in the German resistance movement against Hitler. People of high rank in the resistance movement found this to be very important for bringing down Hitler, and would use it for Hitler's trial if he ever got arrested. But, you know, Hitler took the easy way out, so they didn't get to use it. It's a transcript from a man named Hans Mend, who had an opportunity to get to know Hitler very well. Mend was a dispatch writer on the staff of the Liss Regiment, along with Hitler, where he got to know a lot about him. His personal characteristics, his quirks, his disposition, his foundationless political views, and last but not least, his love of men. The Mend Protocol goes like this. Mend states that Hitler was physically unfit to serve in World War I and was rejected after he volunteered for service in 1914. Since he was unemployed in Munich, he wanted to join the military, just so he could get consistent square meals because he was broke again. Since he was rejected, he stationed himself in front of the Wittelsbacher Palace at a time when King Ludwig usually left the building. He managed to stand in front of the King's path and convinced him to let him fight, and that's how Hitler was able to join the List Regiment. Hitler was never involved in actual combat, and he was nothing more than a runner. Every two or three days, he would deliver a message, and the rest of the time, he mostly did what he wanted. He painted, talked politics, had altercations with other military members, and was soon nicknamed Crazy Adolf. He would often fly into a rage if someone contradicted him, and would throw himself to the ground and froth at the mouth. Private Ernst Schmidt, Someone who Hitler was friendly with because they sometimes worked on building sites together became very close. Hitler was also friendly with a few others as well. He was even good friends with a Jewish combat soldier named Lippert, who Men says at the time of writing this in 1939 was exempt from the anti-Jew laws and was a clerk at a Nazi headquarters. Hitler tended to an injured Colonel Engelhardt and made a big fuss about it to Lieutenant Hutman who eventually promoted him to Iron Cross second class, and in 1918, he eventually got Iron Cross first class. Mend says as the soldiers got to know him better, they noticed how he never looked at a woman and suspected he was gay. They said he had very feminine characteristics, like never having firm beliefs. Okay, keep in mind, this was the 1910s, so the views on men and women were a bit different, so this on its own isn't much but there's a bit more. One night, the soldiers were at the Lefebvre Brewery at Forns, and that night, everyone slept on some hay outside, but they noticed Hitler was bedded with Schmidt, who they called his male whore. Then, someone turned on their flashlight and mocked the two by saying, take a look at these two Nancy boys. After this, Mend says he took no further interest in Hitler's love life, but he couldn't escape Hitler's political tirades. 
He said he called himself a representative of the class conscious proletariat. And wherever he thought he could, he called his superiors robber knights, highwaymen of the nobility, or a clique of bourgeoisie exploiters. After Men completed his war service, he bumped into Hitler again in Munich, who was still with Schmidt. He said Hitler seemed pleased that many countries went into turmoil after World War I, and said, thank God the kings have toppled off their perch. Now, we proletarians also have a say. Hitler was at the time living at the Hostel for Homeless at 29 Lothrasse. At one point, Mend allowed him to stay at his apartment for a few days. After that, he went to a military barracks because he was hungry. He was able to get in because of his Iron Cross first class promotion and because he was a professional yapper, telling war stories and whatnot. Mend says it was indeed striking that Hitler, who served from the beginning to the end of the war, didn't get promoted any further. In early 1920, Mend heard Hitler became a public speaker, so he went to some of his speeches in secret. He said that Hitler's colors sure have changed. His political views were a lot different than what he was espousing to Mend when they were in the military. Hitler again stayed with Mend for a night or two. Hitler said he couldn't go home, and when Mend asked why, Hitler wouldn't tell him. After having contact with Hitler again and again after the war, Mend says it confirmed his thoughts on him. He said that Hitler was a book of a thousand pages and was completely two-faced. He was hypocrisy personified. One of his faces was that of a self-important busybody, a face that came out in front of his superiors and if need be, his comrades. He was a tattletale who would rat someone out if it benefited him. That is why everyone, including his comrades, were wary of him. Men described his second face as that of a secret sinister criminal. He said his whole attitude was that of a ruthless person who knows how to wrap himself in a halo. He said he was a great actor and lied whenever he opened his mouth. Mend also says that he tried to get a senior position with the Communist Party, but the Munich Directorate of the Communist wouldn't give it to him, since a senior post would have exempted him from the need to work, which is what they thought his goal was. Even though he expressed his searing hatred of all property owners, they distrusted him. Eventually, he joined a right-wing paramilitary organization called the Free Corps Ep, because they trusted him since he had military experience. He quickly became a snake and accused people who were in a job he wanted of incompetence, and quickly took their spots until he finally became leader after he managed to take down the Drexler party, who used to be in charge. Mend paints a pretty blunt picture of his experience with Hitler. Mend claims Hitler was a politically foundationless snake. And also, what's more relevant to this video is that he was having a sexual relationship with a man. But how trustworthy is Mend's account? Could he have just made up the whole thing? Well, it is officially attested that men did serve with Hitler, and it's officially attested that he knew him quite well, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's telling the truth. So, let's look at men's life. Mend was known for his bravery in World War I, and got the nickname Ghost Rider. After the war, Mend tried many ways to make money and get a career going, but that never panned out for him. After Hitler's rise to prominence, Mend reached out to him a few times, and Hitler eventually responded. And Mend probably reached out because he needed money. He still thought Hitler was the two-faced hypocrite, but if he can make some money from his old comrade's newfound fame, whatever. So Hans got in contact with him, and he published Adolf Hitler, I'm filled, at the end of 1930 which was an account of his war days with Hitler, and it was very clearly propaganda. Even the gullible Hitler fan knew the book was an exaggeration, but they needed at least some counter-propaganda, since some of Hitler's political enemies had dug up dirt on him, and found out that he wasn't the frontline war hero that he claimed he was in Mein Kampf. The book almost certainly had a ghostwriter. Mend was a simple farmer boy, and could barely string together a sentence at the time but he and his ghostwriter did not completely stick to the script they were given. It mentioned some of Hitler's weird quirks, and even brought up his mega misogyny. Mend himself and Hitler's close friend, Max Amann, both said Hitler was extremely annoyed with the book, but he didn't do much about it because he thought it would be too risky to disown or punish Mend. As long as the media outlets that were still hostile to Hitler just viewed it as another piece of propaganda that presented him as a war hero, it was no biggie. In any case, the Volkshire recommended Men's Memoir as the finest Christmas gift for any supporter of Hitler. This boosted Men's ego. 
He went from a broke nobody to a respected author in the span of a few months. But Hans was more of a latching parasite on Hitler, and not some sort of Machiavellian tactician, and couldn't hold on to his fame for long. Since Hitler was annoyed with the book, he gave Men the cold shoulder, and Mend was offended by this, and newly emboldened by his newfound fame, he confronted Hitler at his usual cafe called Cafe Heck on October 8th, 1932, and made a big scene. It's reported that Mend said, Listen, Adolf, he shouted, why are you ignoring me? Have you forgotten your benefactor? To whose credit is it that you're here at all? We'll talk about that later, you half-man. You jumped up the knife grinder. You're going to get it in the neck from me tomorrow, in writing. I'm warning you. Adolf, don't tempt me. And this wasn't just talk. The next day, he started a scandal. Hitler's biggest journalistic opponent, Fritz Jerlich, published a men's letter to Hitler in the Der Gerade wig. It's a pretty classic case of blackmail. He said he suppressed many details in the book, and if he were truthful, Hitler would not have come out as a hero. Mend ended it by saying he remembered what he used to be. A ballsy move for sure, but from a tactical standpoint, not the brightest move. By saying this, he started a war he could never win. It's unlikely that Mend exposing Hitler as gay would have done much damage. It would have been dismissed as a false claim by Hitler's ignoble enemies or something like that. Also, the National Socialists easily could have dug up dirt on men's not-so-noble past. Even though the anti-Hitler press was satisfied with his testimony, he was never offered to join them. So, Mend was completely on his own against National Socialist backlash. At first, Hitler didn't do anything. He was still biding his time to deal with the matter. At the end of that November, Mend realized his situation and went on the defensive. In a press release dated December 1st, 1932, his tone gets a lot more subdued. He doesn't take back his original stance or anything, but he does say he came out publicly with the information because of Hitler's uncomradely behavior. He claimed he was mad at Hitler's entourage for keeping him from his friendship with Hitler, which Hitler assured him of in the letters they shared. He said he didn't deserve the backlash he got from his statement, because he selflessly supported and defended Adolf Hitler, his former wartime comrade, even at the risk of his own life. He doesn't talk anymore about deliberately suppressing evidence of Hitler's past or anything like that. He was on damage control. That, that was the gist of his press release. His weird apology took the pressure off Hitler, but Hitler still kept a close eye on Mend. In 1939, Mend said, I felt like I was under constant observation after that. Referring to his first expose, he received anonymous letters threatening him ever since he came out. But more than just letters were sent. About a month after Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, Mend said he was stormed at night on March 9, 1933. His house was raided by people in party uniforms, who pointed their revolvers at him at all times. But a third man in civilian clothes was standing behind them and said, Ghost Rider, you're coming with us. Mend says apparently Hitler didn't order the arrest, and only found out about it by chance and ordered him to be set free after spending three months in solitary confinement. This tells us that the would-be blackmailer wasn't going to be executed just yet. As long as he pledged complete loyalty to Hitler, he would live, which he did. He sent a remorseful letter to the NSDAP and asked to be readmitted into the party. Even though he was in solitary for three months, men claimed he did this of his own will, and said he would now support Hitler no matter what. Mend also burned most of his incriminating evidence, probably on an order from the authorities. Even though Mend got readmitted back into the party, that didn't mean he could contact Hitler again. He was merely tolerated and placed under surveillance. After this, Mend had a few years of reprieve. He made money from various odd jobs, he published another book, and sold some authentic Hitler drawings and photographs to make it financially. We don't have them anymore, but according to witnesses, the photographs of Hitler he had were not only very unflattering, but also showed that he had some suspiciously intimate relationships with fellow soldiers. But for men's business, this was great. It showed his clients and everyone else that he really did have a pretty close relationship to Hitler during the war. This may have been good for business, but this was bad for the National Socialists. They wanted to get the photos back at all costs. 
In the summer of 1936, Mend was taken to court on a trivial charge. The judge, Trial District Judge Wells, was reported to have said, let's destroy him. We're not sure of the exact details because the court records have disappeared, maybe because what was uncovered was too dangerous, but Mend alleges that the Gestapo took advantage of Mend's absence to search his house and confiscate anything he had relating to Hitler. When Mend's attorney tried to get his stuff back, the Gestapo said they couldn't because of orders from higher up. There's a good chance that Hitler himself orchestrated this. The court case finished off with a criminal charge that would not only put him in prison, but would totally destroy his reputation. The charge was sexual offenses against children. He got two and a half years of hard labor and a three year loss of civil rights. Men denied these charges till his dying breath. I mean, maybe he did it, but one, the court records were destroyed, so looking at the evidence isn't gonna happen. Two, this was just too convenient for Hitler. Hitler had the power to bring false charges, so it's probable that they were totally fabricated. Framing enemies for totally false sexual offense charges was a common tactic used by the National Socialists. And three, this was clearly a stacked trial if the judge said, let's destroy him. After serving in two concentration camps, he was released on Christmas Eve in 1938, but was kept on probation. After his release, he returned to Munich, but his reputation was totally destroyed. He was now just another disgusting sex offender. Whatever his motive was for publicly giving incriminating evidence to Hitler's political enemies, whether it was his hatred for Hitler, or him thinking Hitler would be overthrown soon, or the courage of a man with nothing to lose and was willing to take the consequences. Men's statements and actions give a lot of credibility when set against this backdrop. After being persecuted by the National Socialists, he became more outspoken, not less. Dr. Herbert Paulus said later after talking with Mend that it all strengthened me in my opposition to the National Socialist system because he never exaggerated. But at the time, more people were in favor of Hitler than were not, so it didn't do any damage to his reputation. Mend knew the police were looking for any reason to put him back in custody. In September of 1940, he was accused of slandering the Führer. The witness was a woman named Eva Koenig, and again, he was charged with sexual offenses, this time against adult women, and sentenced to two years in prison. And in February of 1942, he was announced dead, which is something he suspected would happen to him. When he wrote to his girlfriend from jail, I can foresee my end. I've simply been in the world too long. Eva Koenig gives us some interesting things he said during his court case. We don't know if Mend brought this up or not, but one of the questions was why did Hitler never get married? And Mend said he knew perfectly well why. He knew it wasn't because he had a malfunctioning wiener. He saw him naked before in the showers in the military, and it wasn't deformed or anything. He flatly said that Hitler wasn't interested in women. Mend shared a bunk below Hitler's and constantly made remarks about Hitler's homosexual love. Mend did not shrink in court and attacked Hitler in a very shameless manner. He said Hitler did all kinds of things with men at night. He also said other men smeared Hitler's weenie with boot polish while he slept, which was a common tactic they used to mock homosexuals on the front line. No one witnessed Hitler's change from an artist with no political affiliation to the extremist politician closer than Ernst Schmidt. We don't know a whole lot about him, which is a shame. I mean, the guy was alive until 1985 and knew more about Hitler's life during this era than anyone else. But we do know some. Born to the son of a flour miller on December 16th, 1889, he eventually became a journeyman's decorator until the outbreak of World War I. We don't know where he first met Hitler. They might have met in Munich or in the military. But soon after they found each other, they became inseparable. They were both military runners, so they had more freedom than most other enlistees. So they had lots of free time, all of which was spent with each other. They were always together on and off duty, as Schmidt himself described. The other soldiers saw them as a couple, as the MEND protocol describes. Runners and soldiers in general were often quite close without it being romantic, but this was more than just a bromance. In 1933, Schmidt told a journalist that three of us in particular seemed to hang together, 
Hitler, Bachmann, and I. Personally, I was very much drawn to Hitler. To his dying day, Hitler never forgot his time as a runner and what it meant to have such close comrades. One of his best friends and someone who stayed by Hitler's side until the end was Max Mann, who was a sergeant of his. Thanks to Max and his other comrades, Hitler adapted and even enjoyed his military service, which he used to avoid. To be fair though, he did try to volunteer before, but he probably only did this so he didn't get deported back to Austria. The more he embraced the military, the more he was able to shake off the burdensome constraints of the affluent bohemian lifestyle he wanted to be a part of so badly in Schwabing. It was here when he discovered what he would later call the glorious meaning of a male community. Hitler's dependence on these conditions became apparent when he and several other runners got injured. Afraid of being transferred, Hitler was nearly in tears and begged his superiors to make sure this didn't happen. He told Sergeant Amand and his other generals how important this community was for him. This is probably why Hitler remained only a lance corporal. Even though he sucked up to authority and was a skilled runner, he never got promoted. He was offered promotions, but he always refused them. But why? Why would he refuse these promotions? Well, we do know if he accepted them, he would have to sacrifice the things that made him want to serve in the army, which were his comrades, especially Ernst Schmidt. And if he got promoted, he would not have been able to have the lifestyle he enjoyed the way he could as a lower ranked officer. If he became a sergeant, he would have to keep a cleaner image. Everyone knew the position of Lance Corporal was only temporary, but a Lance Corporal who never made sergeant after four years of service was considered suspect. Either they were incompetent or they had personal reasons not to do so. There could be many reasons why Hitler didn't want to get a promotion. Maybe he just didn't want to take on the extra responsibility. But because of the sexual relationships Hitler had with Schmidt, and sexual relationships he likely had with other men in the military, as was talked about in the men protocol, he likely didn't take the promotion because he didn't want to give that up. Or it was at least part of the reason. After World War I ended, Hitler seemed lost. The military was his life. But luckily for him, he ran into Schmidt in Munich. The two homeless and unemployed guys cemented their friendship and got through the troubling time together. Hitler at this point hadn't given up on his artistic career. He still took his art in for professional appraisal, even during 1919. With political revolutions happening all across the world after World War I, he still wanted to do art. But politics was also a valid option for him. It was just whatever worked out first. Unbeknownst to the world, this turning point in Hitler's life would also be the turning point of what direction global politics would take for centuries to come. Despite the popular notion that Hitler gave up on art after being denied from art school, he still dreamed of being an artist for many years longer. Unfortunately for Europe, that dream died because Hitler eventually got an opportunity in the political realm from a man named Ernst Rahm. Ernst Rahm will be very important in this series, but I'll talk more about him later. While Hitler was trying to make it in politics or art, Schmidt was looking for work as a journeyman decorator. During this time, they shared an apartment and did everything together. They ate together, walked together, and just about everything else together. Hitler was still in the military and used the money he earned from there to keep his head above water. But he spent as little time as possible in the barracks, since most likely he didn't have any friends there. He lost the community he had as a runner during the war, but he was still very much respected since he had great oratory skills, which was valued in a time where revolutions and counter-revolutions were happening in pretty much every country in Europe. You wanted good speakers on your side so you could get people to join your cause. But his personality was too abrasive and self-centered, which turned people away from him. He would get better at hiding this in the future. Although Hitler was in the army, it was only a stepping stone to doing what he really wanted to do, which, which was politics. To do this, he had to slowly distance himself from Schmidt. By March of 1920, Hitler had a pretty good amount of influence within the German Workers' Party, and Schmidt eventually joined the party with him. Anton Drexler, 
the founder of the German Workers' Party, certainly had a big influence on Hitler. He was very much influenced by Drexler's hatred of Jews, and also his hatred of capitalism and Marxism. By the summer of 1922, Schmidt moved 60 miles away from Munich, and their relationship slowly faded. They still kept in contact and visited each other often. Hitler even sent Schmidt a gilt-edged copy of Mein Kampf, and was personally contacted by Hitler to help make propaganda after France surrendered in 1940. It's also likely that Schmidt's later financial and professional success came from the help of Hitler himself. Some of it was out of heartfelt care for his old friend, and some of it was to ensure Schmidt's loyalty to Hitler and to make sure he never betrayed him. And it worked. After World War II, good friends of Schmidt said he took care to never say anything about Hitler that might have harmed his reputation. Schmidt's personality seemed to closely resemble Hostler, and even more so, Kubizek. An assessment by the NSDAP from 1934 said that Schmidt tends to underestimate his own abilities, which, like Kubizek, made him very receptive to Hitler's tactics. But Schmidt was also attracted to Hitler's love for art and literature. His bookshelf was stocked with Goethe, Shakespeare, and many other classical writers. Schmidt and Hitler were both autodidacts, whose mutual attraction was based on more than just lust. Although Hitler was the more dominant one in the relationship, they both found a receptive companion to share their artistic interests with. Of course, Schmidt and most others took Hitler's sexuality to the grave, many because it personally benefited them to do so, and would be life-ruining to do otherwise. Hans Menz's seemingly little care about the consequences is a rare case. Okay, since Hitler pushed Schmidt to the side while he focused on politics, how did Hitler fulfill his sexual urges while he was neck deep in political affairs? To find that out, let's look into his private life. After Hitler was arrested for his initial 1923 coup d'etat, he underwent a kind of rebirth. All of his self-doubt disappeared and he devised his political strategy and worldview, which is all explicitly detailed in his book Mein Kampf. He changed his old stance, which was based on revolution through violence, similar to the Russian Revolution. He decided he would work his way through the legal route, and wanted to get elected legitly. Seven years later, in 1930, he turned the NSDAP into a well-respected political force, this culminated in the public giving much more credence to him than they did before. At this time, he succeeded in acquiring new comrades, the most important at the time being Joseph Goebbels, someone whose demagoguery was as powerful as Hitler's, which is why he was chief propagandist. But Hitler wasn't really close to him on a personal level. It was a mostly no-nonsense business relationship. Hitler was much closer to these other men. Rudolf Hess, his private secretary, Julius Schreck, his chauffeur, and Emile Maurice, who is missing from this picture for reasons I'll explain later. On the surface, it looked like an employer-employee relationship, which was for sure the goal. On no account could it appear as homosexual partnerships. This is probably why, for the first time, that women appeared in Hitler's public life. On Christmas Day in 1924, Hitler was pacing restlessly up and down Ernst Hans Vogel's apartment, and Hitler groaned, Ah, my Rudy, my Hessler, isn't it terrible that he's still locked up? After Rudolf Hess was released from detention, nine days after Hitler, he never left his side. Observers of Hess at the time said he was an almost pathologically sensitive, weak, and impressionable person and everyone noticed how feminine his mannerisms were. In 1934, Otto Strasser, knowing full well the legal consequences, accused Hess of being a homosexual, even citing Hess's own wife in support of this accusation. But Kurt Ludig, on the other hand, said he was masculinity personified, but also found him unapproachable. He said Hess never once looked him in the eye, like he was hiding something. He had a tough soldierly exterior, but a soft artistic interior. 
He was with Hitler daily. Hitler was even criticized by other party members for being with him far too much. Hitler and Hess were incredibly close. Even during Hitler's initial phase of his political career, Hess's wife believed that well-nigh magical forces were at work, in reference to their relationship. And Captain Karl Mayer reported that Hess often worked Hitler into emotional states and turned that excitement into political agitation. Mayer also said that Hitler would go into seclusion with Hess for days at a time before a big speech, because in some unknown way, he managed to get Hitler in a state that made him a more convincing public speaker. Through 1921 to 1922, Hitler became increasingly attached to Dietrich Eckhart and Ernst Hans Fangel, and Hess withdrew into Hitler's peripherals. So he resumed his studies and spent some months at Zurich. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce the rest of that, but but this place. In fall of 1923, Hitler called him to assist in the coup. When that failed, he fled to Austria and stayed at Karl Hossifer's house a man 25 years older than him, and is suspected to have had a sexual relationship with Hess before Hitler came into the picture. But Hess eventually turned himself in. While they were being detained, he reunited with Hitler and soon became Hitler's leading associate and were both housed in the Feldherren wing, with many other officers and members of the NSDAP who were detained in the Landsberg prison after the failed coup. But Landsberg was more like a vacation resort than a prison. A fellow prisoner at the time said it was a lively militant community in which the atmosphere was a cross between an officer's mess hall and a men's hostel. It included sporting contests and rowdy evening get-togethers. They also very much enjoyed the prison amenities, like the bathhouse. In a letter Hess sent to his mom, he talked about the hot baths always available to us in the modern bathroom reserved for us alone. But their behavior brought the governor down on them from time to time. He cracked down on them for being nude outside the fortress living room. They needed to wear clothes and that had to be obeyed, especially since they shared rooms, which they were not doing. Hey. For all we know, Hitler may have been the booty warrior of Germany. Hess talks about Hitler getting his much needed rest from the usual hustle and bustle while in prison, and was able to get his plans for the future in order. The first part of Mein Kampf originated here, with much help from Hess. With Hess, he could test the plausibility of his lies before he went public, and Hess influenced him as well. The Lebensraum, the territorial expansion, concept originated with him. Hess also helped Hitler write part two of Mein Kampf in 1926, where they spent a great deal of time alone in the Kampfhausel, which was a small cabin on the edge of the woods. Officially, he was a secretary, and he was a damn good one. Goebbels described him as the ideal assistant, calm, amiable, shrewd, reserved the private secretary. He arranged appointments and overnight lodgings, he made Hitler meals, dealt with mail, and was his personal advisor and accompanied him on travels. When Hess finally married his longtime fiance in December of 1927, after Hitler told him to, Hess said Hitler was pale and trembling, and he was unable to eat anything out of sheer agitation and could not relax until it was over. Even though it was a marriage in name only, it still bothered Hitler. Although Hess did speak endearingly of his wife, she was never more than a comrade. Even she herself complained that all Hess got out of the marriage was, as she put it, a girl confirmand. Hess and Hitler's relationship cooled down a bit during the early 1930s. But when Hitler became chancellor in 1933, he made Hess his official deputy. He pretty much already was, but this time, it was official. He probably was the best suited for the job. As Hess himself said, I probably know the Furher and his every last thought better than anyone else. Although they were incredibly close, it wasn't perfect. Hitler is reported to have told Heinrich Hoffmann in 1927 that Hess's introverted solemnity gets on his nerves occasionally. He was just not cheery enough for him. This is where Emil Maurice comes in. 
called a high-spirited daredevil whom Hitler became increasingly attached to. Even though he had Jewish ancestry, Hitler didn't care and called him an honorary Aryan. Again, showing Hitler didn't really believe what he preached, as Hans Mend claimed. After serving a few months in World War I, Maurice became politically active and joined Hitler's party in 1919. And in 1921, he became Hitler's chauffeur and one of Hitler's closest associates. Julius Schwab said Maurice probably knew more than anyone else about Hitler's early days up to 1925. Like Hess, Maurice was also arrested in the coup, and was also a huge help in writing Mein Kampf, while also enjoying his stay at the Landsberg prison. After he got out of prison, he served Hitler, and was given the keys to Hitler's lodgings and did mundane stuff like laundry and other chores that would normally be done by a housekeeper. But if things got rough, he was always ready to fight. Like many of Hitler's boyfriends, he was tough on the outside and soft on the interior. That, that must have been Hitler's thing. He was very musically inclined. Heinrich Hoffmann's daughter, Henriette, described his tender guitar playing. She has a memory of him sitting with his back to a tree playing while everyone hummed Irish folk songs. She thought of him as a sensitive person, not an ambitious slugger. Tenderness underlay his affable exterior. Hitler and Maurice were attractive to women, but only Maurice showed affection towards them. Remembering the stay at Landsberg, Hans Kallenbach tells of a romance Maurice had in prison with a woman who lived in one of the apartments across the way. Thanks to the inmate's incessant teasing, the Furher himself discovered handsome Emil's sentimental secret. He dismissed the matter with a forgiving smile. But Hitler kept a sort of jealous eye on his handsome Emil. He probably envied his easygoing relations with the opposite sex. If Hitler felt the same way, he probably would not have embarrassed himself at a New Year's get-together in 1924. Heinrich Hoffmann was throwing a party, and an attractive young woman lured Hitler under the mistletoe and gave him a passionate kiss. Hoffmann said, I shall never forget the look of surprise and dismay on Hitler's face. After that, an awkward silence fell. Bewildered and helpless as a child, Hitler stood there, biting his lip in an effort to master his anger. Incredibly upset, Hitler left the party soon afterwards. His attitude towards women was obvious. Everyone around him, even the prison staff at Landsberg, said women and girls left him cold. If he was going to be the future leader of Germany, he had to get over his disgust of women. Since he was professing to be a traditionalist nationalist, he could not get pissed when girls hit on him, so he asked Maurice for help. They went around talking to girls and chatting up women. Maurice said Hitler gave money to the girls, but never asked for anything in return. They would even go to art colleges together to admire the nude women models. Did Hitler get over his contempt of women by doing this? Not really. His endeavors with women failed, and no intimacies ever took place. He was just never able to get intimate with a woman, even if they wanted to get intimate with him. His fixation on men was strong, and his self-imposed heterosexuality was too dependent on his willpower. Hitler's dislike of women was sensed by his staff, and it was arousing some suspicion about Hitler's sexuality. Hitler thought he got rid of this problem. When his niece, Angela Rawball, also nicknamed Gilly, turned up in Munich. There are many differing opinions on what their relationship was. Some say it was sexual, and some say it wasn't. But any good interpretation of this must include Maurice. Hitler and Geely probably first met in 1924, but never got seriously acquainted until 1927, when he took her, a friend of hers, and her mother on a tour through Germany, in which he invited Hess along, because he didn't want to be, quote-unquote, alone with the woman folk. We're not sure when, but eventually, Geely fell in love with Maurice. 
We don't know if the love was reciprocated, but it's apparent from a letter she wrote to her dear Emil on Christmas Eve in 1927 that Hitler wasn't in support of this relationship. Hitler gave her a thorough telling off, even threatening to send her back to her mom in Vienna. She said she never experienced so much suffering before, but it was good for Maurice and Gilai's relationship. Even though Hitler didn't support the relationship, he compromised. Eh, kind of. They discussed it, and he said she could be with Maurice only if she was under Uncle Adolf's supervision. Not long after, Maurice and Hitler had a serious falling out. Maurice said that Hitler dismissed him because of a personal dispute, and also because he was mad that Hitler didn't support him and Gilai's relationship. Maurice claimed it was because Hitler was jealous that Gilai wasn't with him, but Maurice's assertions are pretty inconsistent with the tone of Gilai's letter. Nothing suggests that Hitler was consumed with jealous love for his niece. Actually, a letter he wrote to his friend, Winfried Wagner, about a week after this kerfuffle showed that Hitler was in a positive mood, and Hitler said he had a cheerful view of the future. So did Hitler and Maurice's falling out have to do with Gilai? Yes, but not as much as many people make it out to be. Gilai is reported to have told Otto Strasser that she overheard a fierce argument between Hitler and Maurice. Hitler told him, you'll never set foot in this house again. And Maurice retorted that if he threw him out, he'll tell everything to the Frankfurter Zeitung, which was a German newspaper. This was Maurice's blackmail which I believe was info about Hitler's homosexuality and not his supposed relationship with his niece. Hitler actually welcomed the rumors about him being romantic with Gilai. In early 1927, an anonymous letter accused Hitler of seducing a minor. We later find out the letter was sent by a woman named Ida Arnold, who was a girlfriend of Maurice. So the blackmailing had already begun. The letter was about Hitler's relationship with a 16-year-old girl named Maria Reiter. Hitler met her at the end of 1926, but no one really thought Hitler was into her. Even Maurice, who was the one who chauffeured them around. Hitler liked her, but not in a romantic way. He would never go further than a hug or a kiss. Reiter said he just didn't know what to do. It was just one of many attempts by Hitler to look like he was with a woman and that he was capable of romance with them. But he was just not physically attracted to her, so he couldn't even attempt a real relationship. So I highly doubt he did anything with her. Although the blackmail attempt blew over, Hitler must have been under a lot of pressure. If people started digging into his private life, they would discover much more. And who knew more about his private life than Emile Maurice? Hitler feared that his women problems would be exposed, so he made preparations to defend himself in court. He was assisted by the senior party judge, Walter Butch, who he invited to his home in July of 1928. Butch had to promise not to reveal the contents of the secret meeting. It all suggests that he was threatened with a scandal, a court case that may expose some shady episodes from his past and ruin his reputation. Butch invited Gilai and Hitler to his home to help them get over their grievous experience in reference to Maurice's and Hitler's falling out. Instead, they made a trip to North Germany to calm down and invited Joseph Goebbels along. It doesn't seem like this helped Hitler get over this grievous experience. Butch became very concerned of what he described as Hitler's contempt for humanity he showed in the fall of 1928. Butch consoled Hitler about his bitter experience of being betrayed by someone you thought you could rely on and told him not to burden himself with this, so don't even bother with revenge and just make a clean break. After this statement, it's doubtful the scandal revolved around his niece. It was probably the blackmail that Maurice had of his personal life that upset Hitler. Maurice probably had to blackmail him in order to dissuade Hitler from doing something rash, like he did with many others. Hitler wasn't in power yet in 1928, but he still had a lot of influence. But the dispute was settled without anything big happening. 
at the time, most people thought all of this revolved around Gilai. In a diary entry by Goebbels, not even he knew the details of the case, but he assumed it did relate to Gilai. Hitler welcomed that interpretation, because a dramatic break from Maurice would have rattled some skeletons in his closet that had to be kept private at all costs. After this, Maurice started a watchmaker's shop, which would have required a lot of money. And who could have provided that but Adolf Hitler? Otto Strasser claimed that Maurice was paid 20,000 Reichsmarks in hush money. Although Maurice was still in the Nazi party, he and Hitler were through. What happened to Gilai after this? Well, she and Hitler were around each other quite a bit. Hess and pretty much everyone else said she was very pleasant to be around and that Hitler made a habit of showing her off to everyone to impress his party comrades. Julius Schwab described her as a big child you couldn't help liking. One can only speculate if anything sexual happened between the two, but I believe it to be unlikely. Christa Schroeder, who was one of Hitler's secretaries, for example, was convinced that he had no sexual relations with her. Plus, I don't think Hitler was attracted to women, so I doubt he could look at her in any sexual way. She just seemed like a pleasant person to be around who Hitler wanted by his side to make it seem like he was straight. Be that as it may, Hitler wielded an ever greater measure of control over her, until he finally had her completely enmeshed in the strings of his own selfish interests. Hoffman reports Hitler saying, Right, I love Gilai, and I can marry her, but you know my views, and you know that I am determined to remain a bachelor. Therefore, I reserve to myself the right to watch over the circle of her male acquaintances until such a time as the right man comes along. What Gilai now regards as restraint is in reality a wise precaution. I am quite determined to see that she does not fall into the hands of some unworthy adventurer or swindler. Hoffman's account is quite consistent with what Christa Schroeder inferred from her accounts of their relationship, such as that he had intended to school Gilai for a life together. It makes sense. Having found a woman to be around, he had finally solved the problem affecting his reputation. The outward appearance of their relationship caused rumors to spread and circulate and they were more than welcome to Hitler. This was much less damaging to his reputation than if rumors of his other relationships started going around. But Gilai wanted to be more than a showpiece for Hitler, and she eventually started to loathe her life. She had fits of depression, attempts to escape, and an early death from a bullet in Hitler's revolver. Many have tried to figure out what happened. Did she kill herself? Did Hitler kill her? And if so, why? We really just don't know for sure. But most people, including myself, believe she took her own life. In 1933, Maurice appeared once more and was able to come back to the party after doing several loyalty tests. And Maurice and Hitler seemed to rekindle their old friendship. Did this rekindling happen because Hitler still loved him? Or was it because he was scared of a data breach from him and thought it would be wiser to bribe him? The truth is probably somewhere in between. Now on to Hitler's other friend. Julius Schreck. Schreck was widely considered Hitler's right-hand man. In the spring of 1923, he and Josef Berchtold jointly founded Staustrup Hitler, which was the Hitler assault squad. The things Schreck's police force did was very exhaustive. Fraud, breaches of peace, grievous bodily harm, and much more. When Hitler's first coup failed, he fled to Austria, where he was soon arrested. He eventually became the first commander of the Schutzstaffel, or more commonly called the SS. But he wasn't really equipped for this role, as many SS chiefs believed. So, in 1926, he was replaced. After the falling out with Maurice, Hitler made Schreck his chauffeur. He, he was pretty much Maurice's successor. He was at Hitler's service around the clock from 1928 onward for private trips as well as political engagements. Julius Schwab wrote that he always knew at once whether to bring his physical strength or his cunning or his driving into play, implying he did way more than just drive Hitler around. 
the members of the National Socialist Inner Circle turned to Shrek if they wanted quick access to Hitler. Rumors even circulated that Shrek's death in 1936 was caused by someone trying to assassinate Hitler, but Shrek was mistaken for Hitler since they looked so much alike. They developed a really close relationship on the long car rides they had together. They would often go on long trips, just the two of them, to explore the German countryside. And as Albert Speer noted, a photo of Shrek hung next to Hitler's mother in his private quarters on the Auber Salzburg. We don't know for sure what Hitler's sex life looked like during this time, but Hitler kept everything super hidden. But how did Hitler conceal almost everything about his private life? He established a circle of blind followers who were able to filter out anyone who wasn't supposed to be involved in his personal life. Hitler very rarely went anywhere alone. He always had some sort of entourage around him, who later became known as the Schaffereska. Many contemporary observers and even people like Goebbels were astonished by the weird people he surrounded himself with. Goebbels, after one encounter, said, Oh, that bunch of Philistines. How can a person like Hitler endure them, even for five minutes? So, what did Hitler find in them? The Schafereska was a weird mix of obtuse aides, stoic bodyguards, stereotypical Schaffers, and vulgar court jesters. At some points, he even had people like horse traders, bouncers, and beer hall brawlers. But by the end of the mid-1920s, three men had become crystallized in this inner circle, and stayed until the end. Max Amann, Heinrich Hoffmann, and Julius Schwab. These men acted as intermediaries into Hitler's personal life. They would manage his household, determine who got to see Hitler, and handled his finances. This is why we can only speculate what Hitler's sex life looked like after 1934. They hid his personal life incredibly well, so we don't know if he was still banging men at this point, or if he directed all of his sexual energy into politics by this point. People like Albert Speer considered Julius Schwab as Hitler's most faithful henchman, even Schwab described himself as Hitler's shadow, and was able to say whatever was on his mind to Hitler, a privilege very few others had. But Schwab and everyone else in Hitler's circle had little desire or ability to influence him politically. They were more like his surrogate family. Loyal, completely dependable, and would do anything for him. Well, that was the outward appearance anyway. But upon closer inspection, it was more like a ring of blackmail. The people in this circle had shady backgrounds. Only a detailed knowledge of embarrassing and incriminating incidents in his henchmen's past lives could guarantee his ability to control them at all times. Ernst Hans Tvangel was convinced that he held what he described as a moral bargaining chip and means of coercion over nearly all of them. They were vulnerable and thus compliant. This was how he spun a web of nefarious dependencies which no escape was possible. But Hitler was also kind and understanding to them, giving them money and excusing bad behavior. That's probably why, even as Berlin was in ruins and the Allies were in Germany, Schwab made the trip to Hitler's Munich apartment and burned everything that was related to Hitler. We still don't know what was in these documents, and he absolutely refused to tell anyone. He only gave us a vague idea what could be in them. He said that their disclosure would have had disastrous repercussions, probably on himself, but most of all, on Adolf Hitler. Gilai's death in 1931 was a big problem for him. His public appearance was once again in jeopardy. As a huge public figure, he couldn't leave his opponents and supporters in the dark about his reasons for his lack of marriage. In the months after Gilai's death, Hitler met two women that liked him and he also liked back. The first was Magna Quaint and the second was Leni Reifenstahl. Hitler could have married either one. Instead, he was reluctant, but it was effective in protecting his public image, although the solution was only palliative. First, we have Magda Quaint, private secretary and lover of Joseph Goebbels. 
she was so excited by Hitler's public speeches that she called him at his Berlin headquarters. And their first encounter went well, and it seemed possible that a closer relationship would form. She admitted that she was deeply in love with him, but eventually, she realized the feelings weren't mutual. She said, It was not until I realized that, discounting his niece Gilai, whose death he will never get over, Hitler cannot love any woman, but only, as he always says, his Germany. That, I consented to marry Dr. Goebbels, because now, I can be near the Führer. For the first time, we meet a strategy Hitler employed as part of his sexual camouflage. Supposedly, after Gilai's death, he wasn't able to love another woman. But, but, that, but that's Cap. Come on. We already talked about how the relationship Gilai had was with Maurice, and that Hitler just used her as a showpiece. But what also utterly negates this claim of not being able to love again is that he was courting another woman just four weeks after Gilai's death. But since Gilai's death, he was able to divert attention away from his lack of marriage. Now, he said Germany was his only bride, from whom he had to make personal sacrifices for. Of course, this was all theatrical. The tears he shed after Gilai's death may have been real, but the longer he stretched this sob story, the more fake and artificial it seemed. But at least it gave him the excuse to now say he has no love for anyone other than Germany. Leni Riefenstahl gives us insight into the myth that Hitler was married to his country, a myth ultimately based on his inner resistance to his homosexual inclinations, but having heterosexual aspirations. Riefenstahl describes the following. It was a beautiful summer evening in 1932, and it provided a romantic backdrop to her and Hitler's date. Quite relaxed, Hitler spoke of his private life and of things that particularly interested him. Foremost among them were architecture and music. He spoke of Wagner, King Ludwig, and Bayreuth. After he had talked of them for a while, his expression and voice suddenly changed. Fervently, he said, but what fulfills me more than anything else is my political mission. I feel that it is my vocation to save Germany. I cannot and may not evade it. It was dark, and I could no longer see the men behind us. We walked along in silence, side by side. After a long pause, he came to a halt, gave me a lingering look, slowly put his arms around me, and drew me to him. He looked at me excitedly. When he saw how averse I was, he at once let go of me. He turned away a little. Then I saw him raise his hands and say imploringly, I cannot love any women until I have completed my task. Even though she probably wasn't as adverse to him as she wants us to believe, she clearly wanted to be with the man that she and so many others thought would soon be the most powerful man in Germany. But the point here is how we were able to see Hitler's attitude towards women who were in love with him. This instinctive aversion he had to women, which he claimed happened because he had a higher calling, was not true. Which is why he used Gilai's death to mask why he wasn't attracted to women. It was a very effective technique. It showed him as a man capable of love, but was traumatized by Gilai's death and had trouble opening himself up to love, which made these women love him even more. You can't overestimate the extent of the self-confidence Hitler gained from this theatrical gambit. Its effects worked on everyone, not just women. In August of 1932, Kurt Ludke tried to get the real reason why Hitler didn't marry Magna Quaint. Then, Hitler said he had been the happiest man in the world, in Gilai's company. Then, he burst into tears. Ludke was totally unarmed, and completely unaware that the Quaint affair only started four weeks after Gilai's death. Hitler had told Ludke that he kept hearing about his scandalous affairs with women, and all Hitler said about Kurt's rumors was that it was better to have women than men. We find out this turn of phrase was a linguistic borrowing by Hitler from the German-Italian author Curzio Malparte. In his book Der Staatsstreich, I think that's how you pronounce it, the author had described Hitler's profoundly feminine ethos to be detailed by public scrutiny, and he left his readers in no doubt as to the result of his studies. Hitler's feminine side accounts for his success, his power of the masses, and the enthusiasm he arouses in the general youth. 
Not a single affair with a woman is currently ascribed to him, states one of his biographers. It would seem preferable to say of dictators that not a single affair with a man is currently ascribed to them. Hitler would not let this innuendo slide. Hitler's opponents often used this to attack him. He was quick to learn that it would only benefit him to get gossiped about in connection to affairs with women. When he got into power, it became a lot easier to silence the rumors about his homosexuality, since it became really easy to get beautiful women in his presence. Now, he could cut down on his fake heterosexual charade he was showing to the public. It seems only one of Hitler's women was aware of her artificial role in these relationships. It was Hitler's very short-term wife, Eva Braun. It's implied in a remark she was reported to have told Eugene Dahlman in 1938. Always the mission, the mission, the mission. Self-sacrifice and renunciation. In this way, he, Hitler, overserved with a smile. We have happily created the authentic masculine Reich. People naturally believe that my life at Hitler's side takes quite a different form, if only they knew. With Braun, he was able to get his ideal woman, a woman who accepted platonic cohabitation. She was not very happy in this role. He met her in 1929, and by 1936, she tried to commit suicide twice. By the way, she was only his wife for 40 hours. He only decided to marry her when the Allies were on their way to his bunker while the Empire collapsed. When asked about their strange relationship, Julius Schwab only gave evasive responses. When interrogated on why Hitler failed to marry her long before those final hours in the bunker, Schwab said that was the view he took. We often wondered why. We didn't understand it. He simply had his own ideas. More than that, I can't say about it. And when asked what Hitler's own ideas were, Schwab said he didn't explain why, he never went into details, and when asked if he loved her at all, Schwab said he was fond of her, and when asked that again, he gave the same response. Similar remarks came from Herbert Doring, Hitler's majordomo on the Ober Salzburg, said the relationship was easygoing, and when asked whether it was sexual, he said no, there was never anything like that, their relationship never went that far, never, never. Hitler didn't care if Braun was unhappy. As long as she kept up the appearance as his mistress, what she did mattered little to him. Before I go into why Hitler cracked down on homosexuals in Germany during his reign, even though he himself was gay, I want to bring up an interesting case of blackmail which comes from Eugene Dahlman. His account is quite credible due to his close proximity to the events that transpired. Dahlman was a frequent guest of Otto von Lassau, the Bavarian Reichswehr commander, who was like a father to him. One evening, Lassau, Dahlman, and another man were sitting in a dinner hall to discuss Hitler's failed 1923 coup, which Lassau helped put down. Eventually, Lassau produced from a desk drawer a police file containing reports of Hitler's private life from the time after World War I ended. They were from the vice squad of the police headquarters on Estrasse. Everyone in the room gasped at what a dangerous weapon Lassau had forged when he was at the height of his authority in Munich. He predicted that Hitler would gain a lot of influence very quickly, so he preemptively made some blackmail. The blackmail contained the occasions Hitler approached desperate young men, who were unemployed and poor, and Hitler wooing them by talking about politics and encouraging them to get involved. At the end, he would invite them over to his apartment to spend the night. This was recorded many times. They all attested that a man named Adolf Hitler had invited them to meals in small restaurants and taverns in the Munich area. He talked to them about politics and how the world belonged to the Germans, and the conversations went on until nightfall. And these men, living in a post-war Germany, had nothing to go back home to except hunger and destitution. So they were okay with sleeping with Adolf, the good friend who never tired of promising to help them. This also tells us he was cheating with or had an open relationship with Rudolf Hosler, the guy we covered in part one who lived with Hitler in Munich. 
Another time when Dahlman and Lossow talked about Hitler's homosexuality is recorded in Dahlman's The Third Reich and Homosexuality, which says, in reference to Hitler, those privy to his past were as little in doubt about this tendency of his as the scholarly or non-scholarly reader of sexological works. It says, one of these people who was privy was Otto von Lossow, and how Dahlman and Lossow had an hour-long conversation talking about his special proclivity. Dahlman went on to say that Lossow had made the statement that he had ensured through trustworthy intermediaries that Hitler was aware that this material had already been conveyed abroad. In the event that he, Lossow, or his officers were attacked by the Nazis for betraying Hitler during the 1923 coup, these documents would at once be published by the international press. Lossow also strongly advised all present in their own interest to keep quiet about this information. And Lossow lived unscathed until his natural death in 1938, while everyone else who knew anything about Hitler's homosexuality was killed during the Night of Long Knives which I'll go into more detail in the next part. The fact that Lossow was spared was shocking, based on Hitler's well-documented hatred of someone who he called a traitor. In short, it is hard to doubt that such a file exists on Hitler, and Lossow gathered these documents because he thought it would be useful to him. And if it was something inconsequential, Lossow would not have been able to use it as blackmail. So, most likely, Hitler was having sex with men. This is also confirmed by documents in the Lossow's family archives. Eventually, Hitler became too well known in Munich to get away with this lifestyle, and couldn't afford to make any advances that would be recorded by the Munich police. So around 1922, Hitler started his double life that was disconnected from politics that Hans Fongel and other people close to Hitler only knew bits and pieces of. I doubt Hitler stopped hooking up after this, at least not for a while, but we really don't know what form his sex life took after he rose to political prominence. But author Peter Martin Lample said some interesting stuff in an unpublished memoir called Nien Mandes Necht. Namely him and other former Free Corps men knew a lot about Hitler's homosexuality from back in Munich. For instance, his close relationship with a young Edmund Hines. That is why I was not surprised, Lample said, when Magnus Hirschfeld, a good friend of his, later told him in confidence that he possessed two original transcripts, which he had preserved with special care, and which embodied the statements of two 17 or 18 year olds from the time of the essay's foundation, including photographs of those two young men. Hertzfield also cited the particulars described therein. These transcripts pinpointed Hitler perfectly, in the most personal way possible. Hirschfeld had apparently sent them to Moscow, via a special courier. Lampel was absolutely convinced that Hirschfeld's information was accurate, and he believed at the time of writing, which was the early 1950s, that sufficient witnesses were still alive in that time to attest to Hitler's homosexuality. It makes sense why Hitler's personal life was kept completely and utterly hidden, and fractured from everyone, even his closest friends. People in the upper echelon and the political sphere at this time would dig up dirt on anyone if they thought it would benefit them. So, Hitler had to be secretive about this. Otherwise, his reputation of being an uber-traditional German National Socialist would have been destroyed. Ernst Rom became involved in Hitler's life in March of 1919. Rom first discovered Hitler when he listened to one of his public speeches, and was so impressed, he not only encouraged Hitler to join the NSDAP, but soon he himself joined. He defended Hitler against anyone who criticized him, and was invited to the meetings of an extreme right-wing circle of conspirators codenamed the Iron Fist, which Rom held in his home. Hitler's connection to Rom opened up Hitler to a career in politics. Although Hitler was good at climbing up the ranks himself, Hitler's greatest asset was Ernst Rom. Rom was a captain by the end of World War I. 
After Germany lost the war, it was turned into a democracy, and Rom was determined to undo this. It's highly likely that Rom had a homosexual relationship with Ritter von Epp, a commander in the war, and most people around him, including Hitler, knew Rom was gay by 1920. It's possible that this info was used as blackmail to make sure Rom helped him, but Rom seemed to want to help him anyway, since he was the most promising candidate in the German Workers' Party. And if Hitler was blackmailing Rom, it wouldn't work for long, since Rom eventually became very blunt about his attraction to big manly men. In 1923, the German Workers' Party changed its name to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the NSDAP, and by now, Hitler was its leader, and Rom was second in command. Hitler said he was impressed by Rom's hardened soldierly manner, and said he saw the world exclusively from a soldier's standpoint. Hitler admitted at one point that he never would have been able to bring over loyal soldiers to fight for him with just verbal persuasion. Hitler needed Rom for this. He knew how to talk to soldiers. Without Rom, it's likely that the NSDAP would have never come to power. Well, what was Rom's political aim? He said it was to gain the German combat veteran his due share in running the country, and to see to it that the ideal and real spirit of the combat veteran prevails in politics as well. Such a belief would hold contempt for anything effeminate and unsoldierly. He said, Windbags must be shut up, and men alone make decisions. Political deserters and hysterical women of both sexes must be unloaded. They hamper and harm you when there's fighting to be done. To Ernst Rom, the Wandervogel movement was very important. Real quick, the Wandervogel was a German youth group that centered itself around German nationalism and was against the industrialization of Germany. They would often walk in the woods and sing old German folk music. The widely considered intellectual leader of the Wandervogel, Hans Bluer, published many controversial pamphlets relating to homosexual subjects. He said, The German Wandervogel movement was an erotic phenomenon, and discussed how important friendship was in these primarily male communities, and they alone brought forth heroic males who could have strong leadership skills and bring together loyal followers erotically based on their charisma. Dr. Karl Gunther Heimsoth, who was a close friend and comrade of Rom, published an article called Friendship or Homosexuality. It talks about how popular Blucher's ideas were in the Wandervogel and, more broadly, all the Volkish movements, which is just a general term for the traditionalist German nationalist movements at the time. It states that the martial stylization of male homosexual eroticism could be racially charged against the inferiority of feminism and Semitism. He suggested that these nationalist movements should use homosexuality as a weapon. A sort of Nazi weaponization of homosexuality to fight against feminism and Jews. I wonder if that's ever been said before. In almost all spiritual practices, the feminine represented chaos and the masculine represented order, but the Third Reich was hyper-masculine to the extreme. This gay, misogynistic worldview held by these people gave the feminine no leeway, which creates the most rigid and controlled type of government that takes away any and all individual freedoms, so everything has to be done for the collective good, at the cost of the individual. Blucher later posited a direct correlation between his theory and Hitler. He said, Hitler, who read the role of eroticism, also recognized that something of the kind, homoerotic male heroism, must exist. Blucher also says, Hitler was well acquainted with my books. Of course, and he knew that his movement was a male movement founded on the same basic forces as the Wandervogel. It may sound somewhat tenuous to connect all of this to Hitler and National Socialism, but Rom, Blucher, Dr. Heimsoth, and many others made it clear that these homosexual links existed and had a major influence on the National Socialist movement, which I'll get more into later. But ideologically charged homosexual eroticism was very much a cornerstone of the fascist male bonding culture up until 1933. A sort of misogynistic homosexual movement, where they seemed to believe that only a man could satisfy another man. Okay, let's get back to Ernst Rom. It 
it's 100% confirmed that Rom was gay. It, it was public knowledge by now. Rom had many similar inclinations as Hitler did. He was very artistically inclined and loved music, especially Wagner's music. He was also a very well-spoken and powerful orator, and in private, he was very good at expressing himself. For instance, when he wrote to his sweetheart, an art student named Martin Schatzel. The most explicit way Rom told us how he dealt with his homosexual impulses was written in an article called National Socialism and Inversion. We're not sure who it was written by, but it's widely assumed it was Rom. And if he didn't write it, he's the one who instigated its writing. You could sense a lot of Bluher's ideas in it. The author said that it was not just a personal view, but the opinion that prevails all the way up to the fur her. The article said that homosexual relationships were more than just sex, and he stresses the importance of how someone's private life was nobody's business, and that the homoerotic impulses can be safely sublimated into other things, and not to make a big deal about being gay. The main takeaway the author was trying to get at was, as long as one fulfills their duty as a soldier and comrade, they should be able to do what they want in private. Rom was proud of his homosexuality. He, he said it himself. He frequented male prostitutes, which is probably how he got gonorrhea three times, as he admitted. He had relationships with women, but he never got anything out of them, and eventually said he detested women altogether. But he did say he was still devoted to his mother and sister, though. There are actually sources that point to Rom and Hitler having sexual relations. For example, there is an entry in a diary of an unnamed Reichswehr general who claimed this, but we'll probably never know for sure if they did. Some theories say that Hitler learned from Rom how to sublimate his gay impulses into the self-assured erotic male hero that Blueher talks about. When Ernst Rom first joined the party, he decided to subsist on odd jobs at first, like working at a company that made track lane machinery. While doing these jobs, he was still very much involved in politics. In 1928, he published A Traitor's Story, which many National Socialists put right up there with Mein Kampf as integral party reading material. In 1930, Hitler invited him to become the chief of the SA, which was the original paramilitary wing of the National Socialist Party during the 20s. Rom took his post on January 5th, 1931, and gained a tremendous amount of political power within a few years. Hitler was having trouble controlling the SA. They didn't like his strategy of getting in power through legal methods. Boring stuff like voting and campaigning weren't these soldiers' forte. In 1930, the commander of the Berlin SA, Walter Steens, openly rebelled against the party's Munich leadership. This led to an incident where the SA soldiers occupied the party headquarters in Berlin. Hitler hurried over there and succeeded in getting the situation under control, but the political damage was quite large. Hitler still needed to win over the old elites of Germany, and this rebellion looked really bad to them, so he had to make sure this never happened again. So, he contacted Rom. Rom knew how to speak to soldiers. He quelled their revolutionary LARP and was able to make the SA presentable to the traditional elites. But by reinstating Rom, he knew he was taking a big political risk. Rom was quite frank about his homosexuality and was vulnerable to attacks from the inside and out. Hitler was requested to make a public statement about this. He tried to protect himself and Rom, and it wasn't very successful. On February 3rd, 1931, he issued a decree concerning attacks on the private lives of very senior and senior SA officers, as Hitler thought the claims were based on circumstances wholly extraneous to the context of their duties in the SA. He vigorously and on principle reflected requests to rule on these, since it would 
pointlessly waste time more essential to fight for freedom. I am bound to state that the SA is a body of men assembled for a specific political purpose. It is not a moral institution for the education of refined young ladies, but a formation of tough fighting men. Their private life cannot be an object of scrutiny unless it runs counter to the vital principles of National Socialist ideology. Hitler wanted to show everyone he was above the matter, and defend Rom, but this did not suit homophobic people such as Joseph Goebbels at all. He wrote in his diary on February 27, 1931, that can't be allowed. I shall oppose it with all my might. Rom filled all of Hitler's expectations. He managed to smooth over all the excesses and tensions between the SA and the party organizers, for the most part. The SA was getting more members. He was doing so well, even Goebbels couldn't deny it. But Rom's success was more than just his reputation among the SA members. He also had a policy to assign key positions in the SA, mainly to gay guys. One example was Edmund Hines, Rom's lover of the 1920s. It's also reputed that Hitler was on close terms with him as well. He was appointed as Rom's deputy in Silesia, with the rank of general. Also, the extremely important post as S.A. Gruppenfurher in the Berlin Brandenburg went to another man Rom was intimate with from the Free Corps days, Count Wolf Heinrich von Helldorf, who was said to have had many links to the Berlin homosexual scene. The result of Rom's policy was that the S.A. gradually acquired the reputation of a fraternity of devoted gay comrades. Goebbels noticed this and said he thought the S.A.'s future would be very bleak if this went unchecked. The gay art historian Christian Issermayer said in an interview, I also got to know some people in the SA. They used to throw riotous parties, even in 1933. I once attended one. Someone I knew had taken me along. It was quite well behaved, but thoroughly gay. Men only. But then, in those days, the SA was ultra gay. Eugene Dahlman said something similar. He said it was common knowledge what went on in Rom's houses and in those of his aides. Gay men had gotten command of even the highest levels of the SA. Rom was the erotic male hero that Blueher talked about, and the SA were definitely practicing the male bonding part of Blueher's theory. But this became a problem for Hitler, because this exposed him to attacks by his political opponents and internal party members. No matter how important Rom was in the party, his successes could not alter that. Goebbels was starting to fear that the movement was becoming too sexualized, so he openly started to attack Rom, the man who implemented Hitler's wishes to a T. He ensured that the gossip and rumor mongers were kept busy by cracking malicious jokes about Rom's sexuality at every moment, and made it a point to Hitler that this could not be ignored. People on the inside started to turn against Rom. Goebbels requested Hitler to dismiss him. Because of embarrassing press disclosures in the Social Democratic newspaper, the Munchener Post, and other papers called Rom utterly intolerable. Another man, named Paul Scholes, who was the acting SA Commander East, teamed up with Goebbels. At first, they called Hitler to a hotel to talk about this, and Hitler was dismissive about the subject, but Scholes didn't give up. He wrote a stinging letter to Hitler and must have sent a copy to a man named Gregor Strasser, his superior, because in June, Strasser's brother leaked the letter to the editor of the Munchener Post with the intention of dealing a blow at Hitler and the movement. In the letter, Scholz said he wanted to make sure Hitler knew of the dangers of allowing, as he put it, the employment of immorally objectionable persons in positions of authority. He describes the SA formed a homosexual chain that emanated from Rom. In Berlin's homosexual areas, every male prostitute was talking about the excellent relation they had with Rom and his associates. Also, making the situation worse is that Rom didn't even try to hide it. He even publicly paraded how proud he was not to be attracted to women. Even though Scholz considered him a highly qualified officer and capable of any vile act, he could not but object to his exalted position as chief of staff in view of his homosexual proclivities. The letter also said that Hitler should not overlook it. 
things have now reached the stage where rumors are being spread in Marxist quarters that you, yourself, my most esteemed for her, are also a homosexual. Widespread incomprehension reigns among the intelligentsia as well that there are far more homosexually inclined officers in the Braunus Haas. The publication was a minor disaster for Hitler's party. The majority of party members had no real interest in reprimanding Rom or other officers related to this, cause they said it was a waste of time. The party published some half-hearted and, frankly, pretty bad rebuttals denying how many homosexuals worked in the National Socialist Party. Hitler preferred to keep quiet about this, as he did in 1928 and 1929 but this time, it wasn't working. The Munchener Post kept publishing articles related to homosexuality in the National Socialist Party, as they got more information from insiders. The Munchener published a man named Dr. Meyer, who was a close friend of Rom, who said he was going to expose his knowledge of all the gay activities that went on in the SA. However, he got Jeffrey Epstein, so he wasn't able to testify. This was a win for Hitler. But Rom wasn't in the clear yet. Rom started directing efforts at eliminating Shoals, but with no immediate success. Rom's positions remained rather precarious until early 1932, because Hitler neither defended nor condemned him. According to Heinrich Hoffmann, Hitler declared that he would never reproach Rom for his homosexuality. Hitler thought it would be better for Rom to handle this himself. Was Hitler perhaps gauging what the reaction would be if a high-ranking member of the Nazi party came out as gay without endangering himself? Maybe. We'll never know. But the reaction against Rom certainly showed that the stigmatization against homosexuality was still too strong. If Hitler publicly came out of the closet, he now knew for sure it would not go over well. Election year was coming up, and Hitler still needed more public support. He and Goebbels went on a long propaganda campaign showing how much integrity he and the rest of the Nazi leaders had. And it was working. Until another Munchener Post bombshell. With other social democratic newspapers piling in, three intimate letters Rom wrote were leaked. The letters were addressed to his personal physician, Karl Gunther Heimsoth, the guy who wrote Friendship or Homosexuality. The letters appeared in newspapers and were eventually reprinted as pamphlets. Their authenticity was beyond doubt, as Rom himself acknowledged. The publisher of the pamphlet was a World War I naval officer named Helmuth Klotz. He was actually one of the joint founders of the SA, and was well connected in the party. He used to be part of the Volkish right-wing movements, but over the years his tune changed and he became a member of the Social Democratic Party of Germany. His publication of Rom's letters had been preceded in February 1932 by another pamphlet, translated as We Shape the Future by Means of Our Relationships Corps. In this, Klotz meticulously researched a list of SA commanders who were gay, which there were a lot of, to expose the moral hypocrisy of the National Socialists. The two pamphlets, which the Social Democratic Party used as propaganda, had a combined circulation of 300,000 copies. Rom and many others were now way more exposed to the public. But regardless, Hitler still won the election and took office in 1933, and Klotz was driven into exile and fled to Paris. But how did Klotz even get access to these letters? Well, after the Germans occupied France in 1940, Klotz was captured, and they tortured him for information. They found out a man named Rudolf Diels collected the incriminating evidence, as he was under direct orders from Hitler himself to collect the letters. Hitler must have found common ground with the people who were attacking Rom. He probably did this, one, to gain more control over Rom, and two, to ensure himself against similar attacks. Since rumors were starting to spread that Hitler himself was gay, and people like Albert Grzynski, the Berlin police chief, believed this rumor was authentic. For point one, I believe this because the former head of the SA, Franz Pfeffer von Salomon, said that Hitler did not appoint Rom in spite of his proclivity, but probably because of it as well. He later said that Hitler preferred key posts to be occupied with men with a weak point or flaw, so he could apply the emergency brakes whenever he deemed it necessary. This was pretty much how Hitler kept the whole SA in check. This kept them totally dependent on him. 
they had to subject to him out of fear of him pressing that emergency brake. Rom admitted to Kurt Ludicky that his vulnerability had delivered me into his, Hitler's, hands. Which meant he lost all independence, and now he said, I stick to my job, following him blindly, loyal to the utmost, there's nothing else left me. And to address point two, which was Hitler trying to ensure himself against rumors that he himself was gay, since the rumors of Hitler being gay fired up again after Scholz's letter. For this reason, senior party functionaries like Konstantin Hirol suggested he should dismiss Rom rather than fall prey to developments himself. Our opponents are far from primarily interested in Rom himself, but in hitting the movement in a fatally sensitive spot. And, above all, in casting a stain upon you personally. And that is what we all find the hardest thing to bear. There were people within the party who even planned to murder Rom and everyone else involved in his personal circle. Hitler separated himself from the affair by threatening Rom instead of dismissing him. Rom's opponents wanted to bring him down, but Hitler wanted to hold on to him for now. Although Hitler took part in Rom's character assassination, he still wanted to keep him in his post. It would show how loyal Hitler was to his followers, and that he wouldn't just throw you to the dogs if you came under public scrutiny. Even if he did partake in the show, he would not fire him. On April 6, 1932, shortly before the election, he publicly declared, Lieutenant Colonel Rahm remains my chief of staff. Now and after the election, nothing can alter this. Not even the dirtiest and most disgusting smear campaign, which does not shrink from misrepresentation, contraventions of the law, and malfeasance. This may sound noble, but don't forget, Hitler's the one who ordered Deal to give the revealing letter to Klotz. It seems like party members were not living up to their nationalist socialist principles, which you think would damage their reputation. But Hitler's popularity only increased during the ROM scandal. But why? Well, on an emotional level, those on the political left fought against Hitler by almost exclusively campaigning against ROM and associates. Which is also how Hitler was able to tone down the rumors that he himself was gay, since ROM was taking most of the brunt. They clung to the documents that were handed to them, hoping this evidence would destroy their enemies. But they failed to see that Hitler was baiting them. The kind of evidence they had was something that most political enemies only dream of. But while they were focused on Rom, Hitler continually posed himself as a national messiah far removed from such a petty squabble. And soon, the Social Democrats were alone in the attack against Rom. The Vorwarts, another social democratic newspaper, wrote, One might suppose that this opinion, indignation at the essay's sexual proclivity, is common property in political circles. But neither the parties of the right, nor, above all, the Protestant clergymen who beat the drum for Hitler, take any offense to Ramosexuality. So, the smear campaign against Rom totally fell flat and overall made it look like Hitler was standing up for his fellow soldier, regardless of what the newspaper said about his personal life. These events also took the pressure off Hitler. This was very close to the time Hans Mend threatened him. Rumors about Hitler being gay were coming in from all sides, so the Rom scandal helped take much of the attention off Hitler and protect his personal life. After all of this, Rom's reputation was still very much intact, and by 1933, he was considered one of the most powerful figures in all the National Socialist hierarchy. There were times when he was even called a second Hitler. Even though Hitler was quiet during some parts of the affair, and even occasionally took part in the attack, he overall defended Rom, which helped save his reputation. At this time, Hitler didn't care if someone was gay. He had no qualms promoting gay guys, such as Karl Ernst, who was one of Rahm's lovers. He was appointed to command the SA's Berlin-Brandenburg detachment. But there was considerable shock within the party at Hitler's decision to promote Ernst. They called Ernst a nasty piece of work, and thought of him as an amoral individual. But it became clear to everyone that Hitler would nip any renewed opposition to his ROM policy in the bud real quick. 
gay men within the party suddenly had no fear to publicly talk about it. It is reported that Hitler told Hermann Roschning at the Reich Chancellery in the summer of 1933, I won't spoil any of my men's fun. If I demand the utmost of them, I must also leave them free to let off steam as they want, not as churchy old women think fit. I take no interest in their private lives, just as I won't stand for people prying into my own. So the homosexual circle that centered on Rom continued. It was described by the Reichsbank president, Haslemar Schacht, that homosexuality was not only socially acceptable, but a political power factor. So why in a few months time were Rahm and his associates overthrown? As Hans Stangl wrote in an unpublished passage, Ernst, Karl Ernst, another homosexual SA officer, hinted in the 1930s that a few words would have sufficed to silence Hitler had he complained about Rahm's behavior. This is probably true based on Rom's behavior after the first round of accusations against him blew over. This seemed to embolden him, and he seemed to abandon his unwavering loyalty to Hitler and decided to pursue his own policies. As early as April 1931, Rom instructed the agent George Bell to build up an intelligence service in the SA, and also to fend off attacks of his personal character. He was trying to find a way to discourage people on the inside of the NSDAP who wanted to exploit Rom's predicament. He accomplished this by digging up dirt on others. He wanted as much blackmail as possible. But after Rom's letters were published, he changed his tactics. Rom now came to terms with opposition forces. A meeting was arranged with a former Reichswehr comrade of Rom, a one-time intelligence officer named Karl Mayer, who was now part of the Social Democratic Party. They tried to figure out who really started the attacks on Rom. Mayer was okay with this arrangement because he and Rom knew many secrets about Hitler's early days in Munich, especially from 1919 to 1920. They agreed to keep the contents of the meeting confidential and soon after, they had a separate meeting with Hitler. We don't have details, but he wanted Hitler to know that they had dirt on him. He was trying to intimidate him. Mayer seemed to believe that Rom knew that Hitler was behind the letter leaks, so it makes sense why he had all of this prepared. Rom wasn't finished yet. He started looking for more people to help put pressure on Hitler. Rom found help from an individual named Kurt von Schleicher. His cooperation with Rom may have something to do with Schleicher himself, who was rumored to be abnormally inclined. Being a Reichswehr minister, Schleicher not only had access to Hitler's military records, but possessed an efficient secret organization called the Abwehr. Them both potentially possessing explosive information is documented by a reliable source. According to Brudau and Hitler Ross, Schleicher privately intimated that Rom had informed him of certain matters, and that those matters were of such a nature that their publication could inflict severe political damage on Hitler. Fritz Gunther von Tursky overheard an altercation between Hitler at the outer office at the Reich Chancellery in early 1934. It went like this. It was clear that a very heated argument was in progress in Hitler's room. After a short while, I said to Bruckner, Hitler's aide-de-camp, who's in there? For God's sake, are they killing each other? To which Bruckner replied, Rom's in there. He's trying hard to talk to the old man, he always called Hitler that, into going to the Reich president and forcing him to grant requests. So, I waited. The door was relatively thin, and one could catch isolated, particularly Lloyd scraps of conversation indeed. Whole sentences. Again and again, I hear, I can't do that. You're asking the impossible of me. But I learned from the Reich President's Palace a few days later that Hitler had, in fact, submitted Rom's request to Hindenburg, but had me with a very curt and brusque refusal. This may shed some light on why Hitler reevaluated Rom and tried to defend Rom during the scandal. Rom had something up his sleeve that Hitler was afraid he would play. Hitler was facing a tense atmosphere of distrust and blackmail. As Hitler himself put it, he was in a crisis that could only too easily have had truly devastating consequences for the foreseeable future. His political self-preservation convinced him to escalate things. 
Hitler was always trying to conceal his own homosexuality, but he now deemed it necessary to take it a step further by eliminating all dangerous witnesses. And right at the top of potential blackmailers was Ernst Rom. Rom and many others were spied on for months, and in April of 1934, Heinrich Himmler, with a freshly given new host of powers, got involved in the Rom affair. In mid-May, a new decree on the imposition of terms of imprisonment was issued. By abolishing judicial reviews of appeals against detention and placing other severe constraints on the ability of defense counsels to intervene on their clients' behalf, this opened the door for a Gestapo tyranny. If there were no courts hearing the revealing evidence, it would be much easier to keep the info a secret. Rom and other senior SA officers posted their own guards. According to Carl Ernst, Rom began to deposit important evidence in a safe place because he had to be ready for everything. So Rom knew what was brewing, but Rom was outnumbered. Hitler, Himmler, Goebbels, Heydrich, Goring, and other powerful leaders in the party all had something to gain from Rom's downfall. Between June 30th and July 3rd of 1934, an official 85 party members were killed, Rom included, and some estimates even suggest a thousand people were killed, most of which knew stuff about Hitler's personal life, even if they long since distanced themselves from Rom. Even the man that Hitler suspected had Otto von Lossau's blackmail, Gustav Ritter von Kahr, was executed. Immediately after this, the Reich's government enacted the Law Relating to National Emergency Defense Measures, which essentially declared everything they just did as legal, so the authorities had no grounds to investigate the event. After the Night of Long Knives, Hitler was asked if they could have picked another procedure to deal with them. Hitler replied, only someone who is acquainted with the facts and has closely followed the clandestine maneuvers and intrigues of recent months is entitled to explain by what methods the threat might have been averted. If Rom didn't have some nasty blackmail on file, Hitler could have easily just dismissed him if he was giving the party a bad reputation. Rom and the many others killed definitely had something on him, so everyone who may have even had a small chance of knowing anything about Hitler's private life was killed or imprisoned. The victims' houses were thoroughly searched for any revealing information, and two weeks after the bloodbath, Hitler felt safe that no incriminating evidence got out. On July 13th, he gave what many would say was the most rhetorically skillful speech of his career. Hitler had yet again whittled himself out of a tight spot while also consolidating political power to an ever greater degree. But Hitler wanted to make sure nothing like this ever happened again, so he enacted some of the most paranoid and draconian measures to prevent any information leaks, an extreme crackdown on homosexuality. Although Hitler managed to scare away his remaining enemies after the massive purge, outside media sources were harder to control. For example, the Paris-based communist Deschutz Volkszeitung said that Hitler had eliminated initiates who had become dangerous, initiates who were privy not least to the private life of the Führer, who is himself a homosexual. Otto Strasser, who was disgusted at the hypocrisy of Hitler's recent actions, published a list of people who he knew were gay but were exempt from the purges. People like Rudolf Hess, Karl Kaufmann, Wilhelm Brucker, one of Hitler's aides, and several others. The list contained a postscript on how he knew this information. He said he got the information from people like Rom and Gregor Strasser, both of whom were already dead, but he also got it from Dr. Frick. General von Heinemann, Major Butch, the current chairman of Ulschla, and many other credible sources. But thanks to the incredibly brutal press censorship, this info only found its way to a few foreign newspapers, and Hitler just dismissed it as protest after the ROM operation. But it still bothered him. In a July 11th, 1934 interview in the New York Herald Tribune, Hitler said it was a misfortune for us all, that wild and unfounded rumors about us are being constantly disseminated in America and other countries. 
Above all, it made him feel uneasy that he could never be sure what his own people were saying about his homosexuality. So, he took further precautionary measures. About a year before the Rom murders, the Malicious Practices Act was passed, and he took full advantage of this law. It punished remarks that might seriously prejudice the welfare of the Reich or the reputation of the Reich government or that of the NSDAP or its organization. The same went for remarks about leading members of the government or the NSDAP that are openly malicious, inflammatory, or indicative of base sentiments, and for the countering of malicious attacks on the government of national revolution. Prosecution was made dependent on Adolf Hitler, so he could do whatever he wanted in these cases. He had to protect his image as the supreme leader of Germany by stifling the widespread rumor that he was a homosexual. To the best of our knowledge, most of the remarks the court had to deal with were related to Hitler's homosexuality, so even the strict control of the press didn't stop the rumors. For example, a gay engineer who was a member of the National Socialist Party got two years in prison for saying, look at our fur her, he also pleasures himself with gentlemen. This is just one of many cases. The zero tolerance policy towards these remarks shows how much these accusations bothered him. Even Han Walter Ost, who was a member of the Reich press chamber, got in trouble. He told an informant, that the Furher keeps a young girl named Everil, i.e. Eva Braun, on the Auber Salzburg. The Furher keeps this girl solely for the purpose of concealing his homosexuality from those around him. Saying this got him a two-year prison sentence. But from 1943 onwards, remarks about Hitler's homosexuality were punishable by death. But back to 1934. Hitler instructed the SS to keep a register of all homosexual misdemeanors throughout the country, and a department should be established just for this. Hitler's interest in illuminating every corner of the homosexual scene in Germany shows how uneasy he still felt after destroying Rahm and his associates. He wanted to get a grip on this problem, so it could never threaten his power again. A few months after the Malicious Practices Act was enacted, the mere suspicion of what they called indecent acts was enough to arrest someone. This opened the door to arbitrary police procedures on the still thriving homosexual subcultures, which, up until this point, Hitler never really cared about suppressing. During the later half of the 1930s, a massive campaign against homosexuals was launched. They were threatened with torture, detention in concentration camps, and even death. They were registered throughout the Reich, similar to the Jewish population, and by 1939, around 30,000 were under surveillance, with many being put in concentration camps. To show which lot they belonged to, they were made to wear the pink chevron, just as Jews were made to wear the Star of David. They had some of the highest death rates in the camps, at 60%. An estimated 5,000 to 15,000 gays were killed during the Holocaust. Hitler knew how well homosexual subcultures were able to hide themselves. He knew from experience, which made him mortally afraid. He knew, at any time, this group could at any point yield some reputation-destroying secrets. For many in the National Socialist Party, ideological homophobia was their reason for cracking down on gays. But for Hitler, this sudden view change towards homosexuality was likely him wanting to nip the potential threat of exposure in the bud. After the Night of Long Knives, there occurred a transition in the National Socialist Party. A sudden and radical transformation, from what once used to be a nonchalant toleration of homosexuality to the most drastic view, which was the view of eradicating them entirely. Only a select few associates and Hitler himself had the privilege of practicing homosexuality. The rest had to go into hiding even more so than before, all because of Hitler's extreme insecurity and desperation to stay in power. After all this info, our interpretation of Hitler and the Third Reich is turned on its head. It adds to our growing catalog of Hitler being a hippie icon. He was a vegetarian, artsy, loved drugs, 
and now we know he practiced free gay love. It also sheds new light on the reasons behind some of Hitler's actions. His draconian methods of suppressing homosexuality did not stem from his National Socialist ideology, which he likely didn't believe much himself. It came from him trying to save his reputation. And also, anyone aspiring to put more Hitler sex games on Steam can be more historically accurate. All jokes aside, Hitler was probably gay. I didn't even include everything we have that hints at his homosexuality. Claims from credible sources such as Eric Ebermeyer, Helmut Kohl's, Hermann Roshing, and David Lewis. This leaves us with a very different version of Hitler and the events surrounding him that are taught in public schools.